If you're planning an international move but are feeling overwhelmed or don't have enough time to figure out and manage every step of the process, reach out to Start Abroad. We're an end-to-end -end international relocation company that can help with everything from getting a visa to finding a place to live to relocating your pet and much more. Moving abroad can be challenging, but you don't have to go it alone. Sign up for a free consultation. Check the show notes of this episode for a link to an exclusive offer for Blacksit Global listeners. We all got some type of trauma and we all need to be working through that trauma. And we don't need to get up against somebody and start bumping up against their trauma without being honest and open and saying, yeah, I'm working through this. And how can I support you? Close your eyes and imagine living a life you love, unapologetic and unbothered. Free from daily microaggressions from Karens and Kens. Free from the fear of police brutality and systemic racism. Wouldn't that feel amazing? Now open your eyes. What if I told you that it's possible? Hear inspiring stories and get the actual blueprints from brothers and sisters of the diaspora who are living out their wildest dreams abroad. You've heard the term, now be inspired by the movement. I'm Krishan Wright, and this is Blacksit Global. I'm excited, y'all, for this episode of the Blacksit Global podcast because we are venturing to the motherland. In this episode, I'm delighted to have a conversation with Ashley in Africa, aka Ashley Cleveland, who is joining us today from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Welcome to Black Sit Global, Ashley. Yes, thank you for having me, Black Sit Global, a community. I'm such a fan and I'm so excited to talk to you today, Krishan. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited because you, I followed you for quite some time and you know, I know we'll get into it in our conversation. You are the embodiment of living your best life living the soft life, the soft, luxurious life, <laughs> and raising <laughs> two children. I always like to start with the origin story. So tell me a little bit about your background in pre-Tanzania. <laughs> Let's do it. So I moved to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania from Atlanta, taking it a bit back from there, grew up in the Northeast. Um, I moved around a lot as a kid, uh, left Boston when I was 10 years old and lived in multiple cities in Florida, including Tampa and Miami. I went to school in Tallahassee at the Florida State University. And then I went to work for the most part in to Atlanta. That's where I went to work. And bounced around a bit for career. I mean, I'd always, having moved around a lot as a kid, I always felt comfortable with going where the opportunity was. So I lived in Atlanta for a while, took a job in Miami working for Red Bull, left that job, started a restaurant back in Atlanta. A couple years later, got another job where I was working out of New York. So yeah, I'd lived in a lot of different cities in the U.S. before my last role was actually doing economic development for the city of Atlanta. So I worked in conjunction with corporations that were essentially running the city, bringing new organizations there and collaborating with the city of Atlanta and the state of Georgia on the different policies and things to bring talent, bring corporations. And so Having seen all the insides and outs of Atlanta, I just knew that Atlanta was it for me. But uh, yeah, there was a different plan that took place. <laughs> yes, I want to talk a little bit about that that mm -hmm. step change, because for many people, whether you've lived in Atlanta or visited, in many people's minds, Atlanta is like the Mecca, right? You see all of these Black people, you know, these right. Black-owned businesses. There's right. just so much there. And you kind of talked about it, right? Like you thought this was going to be it. And I guess mm -hmm. it was it until it wasn't. So set the stage Correct. for me, like what was going on for you at that point where you're like, okay, I've bounced around at different places. I've tried these different things, but was there something that really felt like there was more that you needed to accomplish or tell me what was going on for you? I'd say the pivotal shift for me was motherhood. 
right? When I embarked on motherhood. And so I have two daughters. One is not my biological daughter. She is biologically my niece, but I've been raising her since she was three years old. So while I was a mother, I had had a different experience because I took her on at three years old. I had a lot of support. You know, I was still able to be very assertive in my career because I had a lot of support. Fast forward about five years when I became pregnant with my youngest daughter, I was working at an organization that didn't have maternity leave. And this was also the organization that I was working for that was attracting all of this talent and these businesses to Atlanta. And so I put together a proposal citing a lot of the different, you know, maternal leave policies that some of our membership, these top fortune 500, 1000 companies that we were attracting and that we were boasting about, you know, hosting in Atlanta. And I submitted that to my HR department and they declined. They said, well, you know, we have never had this before. So this would have to be retroactive to all of the other moms and blah, 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 excuses, excuses. So that was really kind of the beginning of (laughs) the next steps. I started to see like how common it was for mothers to not have this type of support. And then I was also in Georgia, which is known to be the second highest, have the second highest infant and maternal mortality rate in the country. So I was like, how is this happening? You know, like all of these things I had never paid attention to. So these were all these little nuggets that started to show up in my life. And so, you know, during my pregnancy, I was intentional about getting, you know, a black midwife, a black doctor, a black doula, going to a black chiropractor. Like I was just very intentional about that process. And fast forward, I had, you know, what was a very healthy pregnancy, but after giving birth, there were some complications. And I received an email from this same organization while I was actually in the NICU with my daughter saying, I know we agreed to a slower return back to work, but since then we have changed our mind and we expect you to be in after your 90 days is completed. And I was literally sitting next to my daughter, her lifeless body in the NICU. She was two days old. And so I obviously was like, wow, like this is Atlanta. While it's said to be, you know, this so-called Mecca, the support that I'm receiving as a mother, but also a Black mother is just, it's just wild. So those were kind of the bubblings, the underbelly started to take shape. And, you know, fast forward, I was laid off from that job um, after kind of creating some email chains (laughs) um, after this experience and even going back into my role Um, after my maternity leave, the next job that I took was what I felt to be my dream job in a tech startup company. And it was a tech startup. So long hours were required. I was also getting additional certifications for my, you know, professional skill set, the expansion of that and to, you know, set myself aside from other candidates. And I was working probably about 65 hours a week. And at this point, my daughter was barely one. And I was dealing, you know, just with a lot of being a new mom. As we went into the year 2020, I was laid off from that job, like the first week of January, 2020, which hindsight, a big part of our development team was located in Asia, parts of Asia. So in my mind, I think they were preparing for what was to come to the West in 2020. But at that moment, I just knew one, like these this dream job fantasy is not real and these jobs ain't loyal. And so I immediately was like, I need to do something else. And the first thing I need to do is restore myself because the work, the postpartum experience being a new mother, it it took a lot out of me. And luckily I was able to spend the most of January really restoring myself, spent some time in intense therapy group therapy, um, psychotherapy. I went on retreats and ultimately came to the conclusion that a lot of my challenges that I was dealing with were rooted in 
white supremacy, <laughs> just to keep it 1000. And while I've learned after living abroad and living on this continent for two years that remnants of this exist and lie really all over the world and globally, my ability to self-actualize in the U.S. was impossible given the structural racism and the structural things that are in place that will always keep me and keep my children in a position of being minor or less than or underrepresented or underserved. And ultimately, once I came to that decision, I decided that I had to be the change that I wanted to see. And that looked like leaving the U.S. We'll be right back. Are you trying to sort out health plans, banking, VPN, and other connectivity for your move abroad? Well, have no fear. We've got you with the Move Abroad Starter Kit. Get yours today at blacksitglobal.com slash resources. That's blacksitglobal.com slash resources. First, I mean, I can't say I can't believe like that happened to you at that horrible job. Because you're right, it is the fact that even today, the Black maternal mortality rate is high, staggeringly high. Just to think that there are employers that literally want you to drop the baby and then head back into the office. Like there's no compassion, there's no expectation for you to bond with your child, for your family to flourish. When we look at other parts of the world, other countries, They value family and they understand that in order to have a healthy and productive society, it starts with that bond between, you know, mother and child in those formative years that enable a child to self-actualize, to see the world in a different light. And when we are so rooted in America with capitalism and being on this hamster wheel also with a confluence of different messages around Black excellence and you're working twice as hard to get half as much. Like there's so many things that we have internalized so much so that for many of us, we also don't see the things that are happening in front of us. And so it takes a shift to say, wait a minute, something's not working. And for many people, the pandemic was that shift, a full stop to say, whoa, I've been working 60 hours, 80 hours, not seeing my kids, not doing this. And did you realize like, you know, we only have this here and all of these things like that were there, but you're so busy just trying to keep all of the balls in the air that It's like you can't even see it. It's in a blur. Yes, it's so true. It's so true. It's literally like you're just going, going, going. And I am a researcher. And then I also studied economics and was working in economic development. So I started to see like, oh, there are other countries that offer really substantial maternity and family leave, right? Like not just the mother, the father, the family receives stipends, receives in-home care, during the first full year, medical is free. There were so many countries and I did like this small blog post on LinkedIn and, you know, it kind of had an interesting virality where I ended up tagging Nike because, you know, some of us may or may not remember Serena Williams, her experience giving birth to her daughter. The white people in my office were like, well, how did this happen? I mean, is it an income issue or is it an access to healthcare issue? And I'm like, Serena Williams is rich, you know, she has the best access, you know, for a rich black athlete in America. No, it's not just a a wealth or access issue. It's a race issue. And so that was like I mentioned, like kind of the beginning to it. And you're exactly right. Having that full stop during COVID was really the icing on the cake, you know, having gotten laid off the top of January. So like, I ended up being at home. I was working part-time for a really great friend um, who I've known for a really long time and we've always collaborated in different ways, but it was like, okay, I'll work five hours, 10 hours a week. It was enough to keep me going, but also 
to slow me down enough to be able to do all of the things that I mentioned, which was like some intense therapy, reevaluating my goals, my lifestyle, what I wanted, you know, and then we went full stop into COVID, the lockdown, and then also the Black Lives Matter. And just, it was this precipice of like, I don't want this life. (laughs) Like, I don't want to feel like I'm stuck in a place where I'm constantly complaining about the way the government is choosing to to act on my behalf. I don't want to continue to have these conversations of why Black people are being adversely affected more and more than our white and non-Black counterparts. I just want to stop having these conversations. And George Floyd was a name that even when the children were learning online, it was still something that they couldn't help from hearing in conversation and on the news. But it was really Breonna Taylor that I just could not bring myself to have a conversation with my, at the time she was eight, I could not have a conversation with her about who this young lady was. And that was when I was like, okay, perfect time is now. I don't got no job. (laughs) These kids are in school, school. Everything is on hiatus. Payments were on hold. Things were, I was like, all right, this is the perfect time to strategize what the next, and at the time I thought six months, eight months would look like. Come to find out we've been in Africa now, East Africa for a little bit over two years. And I don't see us returning to the U.S. anytime soon. Amen to that. So when you made that decision, right, where you're like, okay, I need to reevaluate my life, this life that I have lived and these experiences that I've endured is rooted in white supremacy. This system, this construct in which I live in, I need to extricate my family from for a time being you know, now that we see is over two years. So how did you land on East Africa as the destination? Was it primarily because you wanted to go to a place where we were well represented? Because I know for some people now having done this for over two years, there are some people who really romanticize the idea of living abroad and romanticize Africa as a continent and think like, oh, Mm -hmm. I go to this place and it's going to be Shangri-La. It's going to be like Wakanda. Or there is this other side, and not to say that there aren't people in the middle, but There's also the other side that has uh, rooted in the imagery and what we've been conditioned to believe about Africa being, you know, extremely poor, uh, a lack of services and infrastructure, and, you know, you're better off in America. So when you started to decide where you wanted to go, do you feel like you were somewhere on that spectrum or how has your experience been? My decision and my experience, I think, are definitely in different places on that spectrum. And when I originally made the decision to move abroad, I didn't even have Africa in mind. I had never really had Africa in mind ever, like as a travel destination. I'll just be honest. I mean, I thought about Egypt. And then I remember that on my vision board that I had maybe about at this point, maybe like six seven years ago, um, Cape Town was on that vision board. But ignorantly enough, I didn't even know that that was in Africa when I cut that out and I put it on my vision board. It was just this beautiful place that was in, I think, a bizarre travel. And I was, you know, subscribed to that magazine. So the reality, I I didn't even think of Africa. My first thought was Jamaica because it was close and I'd spent a lot of time there and I love the culture. I love the food. I wanted to be by the water. That was really just like a familiar experience. And then I also had considered South Korea because I'd spent some time there and I really, really liked it. But then I started to see how they were strict, strict locked down during that time. So that was out. And I had a friend who was actually in Jamaica I reached out to her and I wanted to know, like, well, what are the restrictions like? Is it pretty flexible? And at the time, 
it was pretty flexible. Like people weren't really being bothered. The resorts were closed down, but if you had an Airbnb, you could pretty much do your thing. That was great. But then when I started to look at pricing, I was like, oh, this is going to be pretty much the same, if not more, cost me more money than my current living situation. So she was like, yeah, we're actually planning to go to Africa. We just came to Jamaica to get out of the States, but we're, we're out. We're actually going to West Africa. And so at the time, there were no flight. All of, most of West Africa was shut down to the U.S. And Tanzania is infamously one of the only countries during um, the late great president, Dr. John Pombe Magafuli, had his own feelings about what was happening with the global pandemic and decided to keep his borders open for business, decided to keep his country and his borders open for business. So She ended up coming to Tanzania, posting about it, showing her experience. And I had traveled at that point to probably about 15 different countries. There was no country that I had been to where I felt like I couldn't live. And so for her showing that experience and giving me, you know, some positive vibes, I was like, all right, let's go. It's Tanzania. I did some research, got on YouTube, looked at a couple different YouTubers, but I also looked at, again, being a researcher and a person that pays attention to economics. I wanted to know, like, what is the economic state of this country? Like, right. Are there any conflicts going on? Like what's up, like what's happening? And one of the fastest growing countries in the world, a very self-sustainable country. A lot of the food is grown, harvested, produced, manufactured here. And it's on the ocean. There's also Kilimanjaro. There are these beautiful national parks. I think three or two of the nine world treasures, or I forgot that statement, but are here in Tanzania. Three out of nine, I think. Three out of seven or three of them. And the cost of living. That was another thing that really sold me. And so I would consider myself a person who does romanticize the continent. And I do that for several reasons because Especially as a Black person who background in marketing, our people, we like to flex, right? Like we like to, we want to see it before we believe it. And that's just who we are. And so after having learned and being taught and being shown so much negativity about the continent, I feel it only right to be positive and to show and to overly express all of the positive. Nobody questions when people romanticize Paris or Portugal or Cabo or Colombia, right? Nobody questions that romanticism, but they will question Africa. And while yes, Africa does have its challenges, it it absolutely does. I'm sitting here talking to you and have a flare up, uh, allergic reaction and access to healthcare. It was really easy for me to get treated and it cost me under $30 to see a doctor, get medication after talking to my doctor on the phone who wasn't available and he sent me to a pharmacy and got something. So it was like the ease of care is available. The luxury is here. I have a person that comes and cleans my home and does my laundry every day and I can afford that service. So have I had challenges? Yes, but I, I'm guilty. I'm one of those people that really boasts the luxuries of living here on the continent because having lived a quote unquote luxury black excellence lifestyle in America that is romanticized in this very moment, why can't we get used to the idea of romanticizing a place where we are in the majority that will be the most powerful continent in the 22nd. And today I feel like it is. I mean, this is a beautiful place that is developing where the opportunities are abundant and we won't deal with a lot of the things that we're so conditioned to dealing with in the U.S. I lie all over that spectrum that you talked about And the beauty of this continent is there are 54 countries and every country is different, literally. Every country is different. Every country has a different cultural expectation, societal system. Every place is different. And I personally struggle with the idea that, you know, people say, oh, Africa isn't for everybody. But having not been to all 54 countries, I don't make that judgment because there's 54 countries and there's almost, there's a 1.5 billion people here. So why can't 
another 350 million people find the value and the joy of being here on the continent. That's so true because we are part of the global majority, you know, even though language in the United States were often referred to as the minority, you know, 13% of the population at the same time, we are part of the global majority and other cultures are starting businesses and taking root in Africa. And just like in the United States where there's 50 states, there's 54 countries in Africa, get in where you fit in, go and challenge yourself on your own perceptions and misconceptions about Africa. Absolutely. That's a process and I'm looking forward to as I prepare for my Black Sit top on the list, once I get settled is to go to the continent And just give myself time to explore because you're right. Like when you're in and you're functioning on this hamster wheel, we don't even get off of the hamster wheel long enough to take a breather. Most people, if they're lucky, get, you know, a week, maybe two weeks vacation. A lot of times they're tethered to a phone. Either they can't afford to go to really far destinations and because of distance and the time that it would take to take away from their experience. I think what you did that was so pivotal and transformational was to give yourself the time and look at, at your layoff as an opportunity to go within and say, really, like, what isn't working? And then to embark on this adventure in Tanzania and see the beauty for what it is to showcase it through your platform, Ashley in Africa, and to also give your children this opportunity to grow up in a culture where they are in the majority, where they can appear as their full selves and not diminish any aspect of who they are. So with that, like, how have they adjusted They've adjusted well. You know, a lot of times as parents, we're so concerned of how the kids are going to do. And I will say my children were young enough where they're flexible, right? Like they're just down for whatever. So I know like parents that have teenagers that are a little bit more fixed in their social positions in school and things like that, they can have a little bit of a, you know, trouble adjusting because they're going into a new space, but they've adapted well. I tell the story often with my oldest daughter who is 11 and, you know, she, again, she's not biologically my daughter. She's biologically my niece, but you know, that's my baby. And in the U S was bullied a lot. Like she's very sweet, very kind, very shy, beautiful, deep brown skin, super thick 4C hair. And, you know, she would get bullied a lot for being a bit taller. So she's taller than me at 11 years old. She's taller than me, she's about five, six, but she's a loving kid. And she would get bullied at her school, which was all black school, one of the best schools in, you know, Atlanta. And here she is celebrated because she's American. She's the cool kid. She used to live in the U.S. And, you know, her skin color and her hair Tech, first of all, her hair texture is amazing. Like they love it because they love to see her when I do her natural hairstyles or she gets her hair done. She, yeah, she represents them. Like she's a version of everyone else that she's in school with. And so even that experience for her elevated her self-confidence. She is speaking multiple languages. She's speaking Swahili and French. Yeah, like that wouldn't even be something that she would be doing in the U.S. Oftentimes, we're not introduced to second languages until high school. So in at 11 years old, well, at nine years old, she was introduced to French and Swahili. She's doing great. I know she absolutely misses some of her friends. So I do a really good job of trying to stay in contact with her friends' parents. And even I stay in contact with them because everybody at this point is trying to make a Black sit or at least come to visit now that they see the type of lifestyle that's available to them. And my youngest daughter, she is just loving it. You know, she's growing up her formative years of having somebody to cater to her, right? So she can go to our Dada or Shangazi and ask for chips. She can ask for pancakes. She can ask for chicken and she can ask for a cut mango and she's going to get it. Like this is a very child-centered culture 
where the children are revered. People will just see your child and want to help and be there for your child. And so even here, I'm identified as Mama Penelope. So you're identified typically as the mother of your youngest daughter, not even your own name. So children are very much revered here. They're sacred. They are looked at as what they are to be our greatest technology. And so she's just living her absolute best life. She also speaks Swahili. They are really adapting very well. And I'd say easier than me. And they're, they're super excited about the next adventure. So I've learned that we often hear this conventional wisdom of like, oh, children need stability. And really what they need is stable parents, right? Not parents that are working 50, 60 hours a week to provide a lifestyle that they think their children need. No, they need stability. They need presence. I get to be at home when my kids come from, from school. I get to send them to school. Um, I get to prepare meals for them every day if we don't go out. And so this stability in me being able to essentially have been stay at home with them for what is now going on three years has really fortified them in a way that I'm so grateful for. And I would have never been able to give them this me or this experience in the U.S. Oh, for sure. Because, I, I you know, in preparation for my move, I've been doing a lot of work and soul searching and reflection. And even on our Black Sick Global Amazon store, you know, I post different books on mindset because I think part of the process is, yeah. you know, preparing your mind wherever your destination is. And I've been reading a lot about attachment styles, communication styles, trauma, intergenerational mm-hmm. trauma. And mm-hmm. for us, you know, as a people, there's a lot of, you know, gaslighting that takes place and mm-hmm. the realization that for many of us that have endured complex trauma living in America, there's a psychological safety that hasn't been afforded to us. And so when I hear mm-hmm. you talk about your children and their development now and the opportunities that lay before them and before you, what I keep coming back to is the sense of psychological safety that they are rooted in that you're now experiencing and can see the shift in difference. And I think yes. moving abroad for many people gives that them the time and space to really delve into how can I be emotionally centered? Because to your point, when you're in this capitalistic society and you're providing air quotes, yes, you're doing the uh, I have a nice car. I have a roof over their heads. You know, they, they have the best clothes, but are they having the presence with you that's not competing with a device, that's not competing with work, that is looking them in the eye and seeing who they are and reflecting back to them that and affirming who they are in this world, in a world that often gives them messages to the contrary And Mm -hmm. that's where I feel like if we could get to a place where we put an emphasis on child rearing and emotional and psychological safety, we will all be better for it. Huge. I mean, it's so, you're so right. You're spot on. One of the things I was looking at a story and I try so hard to like, you know, I have a bit of what I tell my friends, like this survivor's remorse, because I tend to see, you know, my friends, um, and they post these things on social media. And I'm just like, heartbroken for the women that are losing their children to gun violence, or, you know, their husbands to gun violence, or these different things, and these different experiences. And, A lot of this that we don't realize is because we're raising in the U.S. children that it's not in a culture that values them or values family. And so as we talked about that catalyst for me, which was having being becoming pregnant and realizing the corporation that I work for that gives me this huge, beautiful welcome party and says, oh, we're so happy to have you a part of the team. And they do this whole pomp and circumstance upon me getting into the organization, saying how happy they are to have me. The moment that I decide to bring a life into this world, I am now considered a liability 
And anything that I am doing outside of this job is secondary to what is required for me in this job. And so what that does, and when I hear these women that talk about like having to work too, especially with the cost of living going up, mothers and single mothers, unfortunately, which are a huge part of the society in the US are having to work to pay the bills and their children are what neglected. Their children are not there. And so while their children are being quote unquote, like you said, provided for, the, we are raising emotionally unstable, emotionally unsafe children that are seeking safety in their own devices with people that are pedophiles or people that are preying on their vulnerabilities and their weaknesses, bringing them into gang culture. And like these children are now, yeah, I mean, I think that unfortunate soul that did what he did in Walmart. He talks about just he literally talked about all of the fact that these people were bullying him, but ultimately it went down to his childhood. And a lot of us won't admit it to your point. I've been doing a lot of stuff on understanding my trauma and my emotional attachment because I'm going into a new relationship with someone who was born and raised on the continent. And their level of security and confidence is totally different than that of ours coming from the US. Like, we got some stuff with us. And I'm just like, okay, how can I heal, continue to heal these things that are really in me, you know, and be vulnerable about that work? Because I know that this is a part of legitimately in my DNA, but how do I be intentional about showing up differently, knowing that I am choosing to live a different lifestyle? And yes, it is, it is a whole lot, but it, definitely and absolutely starts with our our childhood and how we're raised and then how we then heal ourselves to raise our children differently so that they don't repeat that. And I'm not going to say that there isn't child trauma in African cultures on the continent. I'm absolutely not saying that at all. But I am saying that there is something that comes with being raised closer to your culture, closer to your own spirituality, speaking a, a language that is present in your lineage, right? Like all of those things incorporate into a level of confidence and self-awareness that many of us in, that have been raised and have our ancestors in the U.S. aren't as fortunate to have. For many of us, if we go back to our childhood and think about educators or physicians or banking or any aspect of our life in which we touch a system, oftentimes the people or the system, whoever owns it, is not someone that looks like us. Even when we are seeking treatment for ourselves, whether a practitioner or a therapist, we have to go out of our way to find like a needle in the haystack. And, And again, That's assuming that that person has some level of cultural competence to even language back to us and validate our own lived experience. And so I'm interested, especially as you are now trying to navigate this new relationship while also doing active work in your own healing and recognition that it is still a process that you actively need to mine to bring your full self, but also recognize to your point, your vulnerabilities. How are you finding the ways in which to navigate that? Is this something that you are opening yourself up to with your partner about either triggers or traumas, or are you carving out that time to do the work and reflect. So I'm just curious, like, how are you approaching what could be very scary territory with someone who has a very different cultural upbringing and environment compared to your own? Oh, that's so dynamic, right? It's very layered because I would say that I started doing a lot of this healing work probably almost three years ago. Once I got laid off from my last job, January 2020, I immediately like got into somebody's group therapy, like because this was something where I was able to go every day for eight hours a day because now I wasn't working. I was able to utilize some medical benefits that I had 
and um, was speaking with a therapist that I had, I was like, I want to be in like more of a resident program because there was just a, it was a lot going on having been, that was like my third layoff in five years. I was, I had a one and a half year old. And then, you know, my relationship at the time was pretty rocky. I mean, to say the least, it was it's pretty much on and out. A lot of women, mothers kind of go through that experience where they lose themselves, you know, in those first few years of motherhood and are really trying really hard to do the snap back to show their employers that they can, you know, they can do both. So I had that time in January to really like go full force into my healing work. And that's when I started to realize like, oh, this is deeper than my current state and what's happened to me this month or last month. This is about kind of what's been happening through my childhood. So I'd say I, I did a lot of things. I am an advocate for journaling. It is something that I have always done, but now I'm super intentional about how I'm able to do and kind of share that. I am also an advocate for group therapy um, where you're able to sit in groups of other women and realize you're not alone. I think that's one of our biggest challenges in getting help and support is we think that our experience and what we've gone through or are going through is like what nobody else is going through. And nine times out of 10, we can definitely relate to our sister. And, you know, we can also see like, oh, wow, I'm tripping because, or yes, my feelings are valid, but baby over there, mama over there is going through a whole lot. Let me take that experience and give thanks, have a moment of gratitude for the things that I do have or the challenges that I have not experienced. Also, mindset. So all of the people, the Abraham Hicks, just put mindset in YouTube and listen to some stuff. All of the things, even I'd say some of the pastors, there are some prominent pastors that are spitting that mindfulness, self-love, self-affirmation. You know, I like to listen to things. That's really how I learn. And even books, I, I'm a big advocate of audiobooks. So I am really big on the toolkit. I'll say though, which I'm happy to share with your audience. In the last year, I have been working more intentionally with sacred plant medicine in the form of specifically psilocybin, which many people know as mushrooms. Obviously, this is not medical advice. This is just my experience. But having come off of a very huge wave of anxiety and depression, utilizing this as an additional resource has really opened up my eyes. I'd say even reaffirmed me as who I am. There's some like real serious medical benefits to this medicine and how it reconnects neurons and repairs trauma that actually happens to our physical brain, you know, because when we're children, right, we're, we're pretty fearless. We try and we do things and we believe all of the things until we're told we can't. And some of that has been, as we age, like different neurons are detached through the traumatic experiences that we have. So this medicine actually has helped to kind of remind me of, of really who I am in who I am at the highest level. Saying all that to say, once I entered into the relationship, which I'll say was a very healing experience because I met him probably a year before I knew I was ready. And I did not engage because I knew I wasn't ready for that man. We, we were friends and we had a great relationship and we stayed in contact, but I was just, I just knew there was still more work that had to be done. And even as the relationship has grown over time, it's been very healing. Triggers happen, but I've been so open with him, which has been the he most healing part about it. It's like, yeah, we've had those conversations. What are you working through? You know, what are you healing from your past and how are you doing that? And how can I support you? Like we had those conversations. And I think that when we can be bold and authentic enough in ourselves to have those type of conversations with our potential prospective partners, we will alleviate a lot of the nonsense of relationships that we go into with people that are not emotionally mature, emotionally available, because we'll be, we'll be fools to tell ourselves we don't, people don't have trauma. We all got some type of trauma and we all need to be working through that trauma. And we don't need to get up against somebody and start bumping up against their trauma without being honest and open and saying, yeah, I'm working through this. 
And how can I support you? Yeah, I'm so grateful for that because this is not how I've ever entered into a relationship before. Never this intentional. And it's been beautiful. And still there's some times, like I was telling him about this experience that I had with the medicine last week. And I was like, I'm going to tell him, we're going to talk about it. And after I was like, is he going to think I'm crazy? Or is he going to think like, what is he going to think? But then I checked myself and I'm like, no, this is me and my full authentic self. And it just feels amazing to be doing this work, to be healing and to have someone see me and value that work. And he said to me the other day, he's like, I think that that is beautiful. The fact that you are intentional about working on yourself because so many people will act like they don't have anything to work on. And in reality, it shows up eventually, especially when you decide to live what he calls, he says, this alternative lifestyle of leaving your home country and going abroad. It is a beautiful experience, but it is a healing experience. You are going to spend a lot of time alone, a lot of time in isolation. And that's when the stuff starts to come up. And if you are ready and willing to do that work, that is the best time to check in with yourself, to be reminded of the things that are serving you and to discard the things that are no longer serving you. Because you will come up against some stuff when you're having these moments of culture shock or you're seeing things and you're like, but this is how it should be. But why do I think it should be that way? Because I've been complaining about this society that I've lived in for all my life. So who am I to say what it should be? How about I sit back, be observant and allow this to happen and allow this to come into my life and know that there is something that I am to learn from this experience. And so all of it has really just helped and led up to what feels like a very, very beautiful and healing experience that I'm having with this man. And there's more to come for sure. Cause it's not linear, right? It's a cycle. Um, but yeah, I'm grateful. It just put such a big smile on my face. I'm happy for you because you're right. Like this whole process is uh, a journey and an evolution and it is important to allow those feelings to bubble up and not suppress them. Because sometimes I think people think like, oh, I'll just move to a different destination and all of the things that happen will just stay where they were, but you take you wherever you are. And so I think it's really important to say, hey, it's okay for these things to come up. It is part of the process. And so what is it that I need to be aware of? Doing a lot of reflection trauma-informed therapy, whatever it is that you need to do, or in your case, you're finding um, medicinal support there as well to do whatever works for you to examine those places and spaces will allow for you to open up to the fullest form of yourself, which I see has happened and is happening for you. As we start to kind of like close, I know you're preparing to embark on another phase. And so you're in kind of like this migration, (laughs) right? You're going from Tanzania. So where are you going next, Miss Ashley? Yes. So we are moving, myself and my two daughters, we are moving to Johannesburg, South Africa. I am so excited, um, but also like nervous. It's like, a lot more nerve wracking than my across continent move, like across the ocean move. And I think it's because I I do have like a level of comfort here, a very high level of comfort. Like this place is such a beautiful place. It allows for a level of slow living. I mean, seriously. So like, and, and restorative healing, like, I mean, like no other. I am really close to the ocean. I can walk out of my door a couple steps and get fresh fruit and vegetables. I'll even see some cows and goat roaming, you know, at different times during the day. It is very much a slow pace of life. And while I have valued that and needed that very deeply, I'm also an entrepreneur, you know, at heart. And I will say that Tanzania as a developing country and in a country where the main language is Swahili, I speak decent, but not enough to really kind of penetrate the necessary spaces and policy and like bureaucracy that do exist here. 
for me, professionally, South Africa is a place where immediately, you know, as an American, your skill set is is interesting. People are wanting to know how you can help their business or how they can help you get into business or how you can attract more people like yourself. Um, so I found, I started my business in South Africa last year um, when I originally went down to create a banking relationship with the stock exchange, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. I realized quickly like, okay, I can really enterprise here with a bit of ease. Right. So like the lifestyle component of Tanzania is ease all day. There are some challenges, of course, but once you kind of get over those bumps, you can really live a very easeful life. Well, doing business is not as easy or easeful, but South Africa, very comfortable climate for doing business as a foreigner, for owning land and property as a foreigner. Also, it's a world-class city, right? So a lot of the things and the challenges that we have here in Tanzania don't exist there because of the infrastructural development. Now, are there challenges? Yes, there are, as every country has challenges, but we are still, you know, in the majority. South Africa has one of the fastest growing middle classes in the world. So you do see Africans in places of leadership. The children will be going to an African-centered private school where the founder is a Black African, South African. Um, they'll be learning, all of us will be learning additional languages. Isulu is one of the languages that we'll likely learn first and Sosa. Um, so super excited about that. And yeah, I am, I'm, I'm like less than 60 days out. Um, so coordinating a move on the continent is a little, it's a lot. <laughs> it comes with coordinating movers and I, cause I'm shipping my furniture. So I had all my furniture custom made here in my home in Tanzania. So I'll be taking that, um, furniture with me, but yeah, I'm excited. The girls are excited. They'll be going to, you know, a new school, same school. My man is there. So I have like a nice little community already i have an established business and yeah i'm excited i'm i'm really excited and i will be spending some time in tanzania for sure because it gets cold in south africa it gets cold there like they have a full on winter so those months i will be up somewhere close to the equator um which includes tanzania and um hopefully i look i look forward to visiting west africa as well but tanzania will always be in my heart and I, you know, hope to continue pushing on, not totally letting go of the work that I've done here and the business relationships that I've established. So I'm excited to continue to fortify those even when we're in South Africa. I love this journey of unfolding for you and definitely, well, first and foremost, wish you well on the new adventure and transition I definitely recommend everyone, if you're not already following Ashley's adventures, <laughs> definitely follow <laughs> Ashley in Africa. I'll link all of her information in the show notes for this episode. And I look forward to having another conversation with you about part two of this journey as you're settling in and the kids are transitioning because it is a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to share. It's been a beautiful experience to share. I'd say for the first year that I was here, I didn't really share much um, oh. here and there on Instagram and like not at all on YouTube, but this last year of like really opening up my experience and sharing it with people, I've been surprised with the amount of positive feedback and support that I've gotten, including, you know, you and your platform. So it has been an honor to not only share with your community, but the community of people that are growing around me. And I would love to do this again with you. Keep oh. you updated on all of the continental shenanigans. <laughs> <laughs> I and, look forward to it because I'm like, thing. we got to do a YouTube live because this is just like to be continued. <laughs> yes, I would love that. I would love that. Thank you for what you're doing and the platform and the community that you're creating and creating space for us to be a part of this narrative, right? Like I never thought five years ago that I would be living outside of America, much less on the continent of Africa. And, you know, we are all over this world. We don't have to subscribe to just 
the life that we've been told to live in the U.S. Like we can go everywhere. And I encourage people go where your heart calls you and where it feels best for you. That may not be the continent. That may be Europe. That may be South America. That may be Asia. Wherever it is for you, we, this is our life we have one to live. And it helps with the community that you've created to be able to see other people, hear stories of us doing it. It just provides a level of affirmation when we can see ourselves and other people that are doing the work. So thank you. And all of your flowers are here. I want to give them all to you now for all of the work that you're doing. It's been an honor to watch your journey and to be a part of your platform and community. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I accept the flowers <laughs> and yes. it is an honor to hold the space because our stories are a part of our narrative. And that is something that I think for many of us, as we are getting this awakening or reawakening, it's going back to those parts of our story which is true in African culture is deeply rooted in oral narrative. And so to be able to bring and have a platform that allows people to tell their authentic story is, is really just an honor and a privilege. So I appreciate you for being so forthcoming and carving out time from your schedule to share with me the evolution and the journey that you're on. So thank you. Thank you for listening to the Blacksit Global Podcast. For more information on today's episode, be sure to visit our website at blacksitglobal.com. It's not only possible to live out your dreams unbothered and in full color, it is your birthright. This episode of the Blacksit Global Podcast is sponsored by Blacksit Global Passport. Join aspiring Black expats, expats, and repats where you can build community, get resources, and gain support along your journey abroad. You're invited to join Blacksit Global Passport. Inside Passport, you'll find exclusive workshops on everything from expat taxes, financial planning, insurance, job boards, accountability check-ins, and more. You can even take Passport on the go with our app available for iOS and Android devices. Just click the link in the episode you're listening to or visit BlacksitGlobal.com and click on Passport. See you inside.